and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, shares of Apple climbing back up to that $1 trillion market cap after iPhone sales stabilize and a massive buyback. We'll talk about what is next. Plus, Qualcomm also out with earnings results with one key new piece of information. We now know Apple will pay as much as $4.7 billion to the chip maker as part of their legal settlement. And as GoPro's YouTube channel hits 2 billion views, we catch up with CEO Nick Woodman about the ups and the downs and the ups. But first, to our top story, Apple's bounce back quarter. The iPhone maker continuing to feel the love from Wall Street after reporting second quarter results Tuesday. Shares rose as much as 7% at one point in trading Wednesday, according to CEO Tim Cook. One reason for Apple's success, stabilizing iPhone demand due to the company pushing its trade-in program in several regions, something that had a positive effect in all markets, and an important market, China. We did experience a revenue decline in emerging markets, but we feel positive about our trajectory. Our year-over-year -year revenue performance in greater China improved relative to the December quarter, and we've seen very positive customer response to the pricing actions we've taken in that market. To discuss in New York on the phone, we've got Wedbush Managing Director of Ed Equity Research, Dan Ives, also Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin, and here with me in the studio, Bloomberg Tech's very own Mark Gurman. So, Mark, what's driving up the shares? Is it the stabilization of iPhone sales? Because, you know, it's, it's good in some regions, though we saw some revenue declines in, in emerging markets, or is it this massive buyback? No, I, I think you're right. This is more so on the iPhone sales. Investors were looking for that iPhone revenue number, about $31 billion. And the truth of the matter is, that is a big decrease from the year-ago quarter. Their overall revenues were down 5%, but it's not as bad as it could be. And there's clear momentum for the turnaround, especially going into the third quarter with their forecast. Dan, would that be your read as well? Look, I think sentiment was continues to be negative on this, specifically on iPhone demand. I think once Cook gave that guidance for June, and talked about the inflection in China iPhone demand. At that point is where the bulls got their feather in the cap. And, and, and ultimately, I think here, also it's the services business beaten. That one-two punch puts gasoline in the bull thesis. So I do have this chart here in the Bloomberg, which breaks down Apple revenue by segment. You see that year-over-year uh, -year decline in iPhone revenue, which is the white bar. Here, we're also continuing to see a steady rise in services. Max, what do you make of the bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, the, the services increase, as Dan just said, is, is good news for Apple because, you know, as the iPhone market matures, I mean, obviously the PC market is, is fully mature, is, is shrinking uh, probably. As, as the market for mobile phones, you know, just doesn't have that, that much further to go, you need something to, to drive growth. And Apple has been talking about services, has been pushing these services. We just saw, you know, the launch of, of, of some new services in, in March. And, and seeing that there's real revenue here, that it's, that, you know, it's, it's turning into a, you know, substantial business is, is going to be good news. And, 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 and it, it, it may, helps Apple look less like, you know, a company that that's sort of, you know, withering or maturing or whatever, and one that still has, you know, has a lot of growth ahead of it. Meantime, Apple shares getting closer, Mark, to that $1 trillion market cap. Just how far away are they right now? So right now we're about $7 and change away per share of going back to that, you know, $1 trillion marker. And as Max said, I mean, it's interesting to see them diversify to services, but I think the key point to add there is that these services aren't true services like you see from Microsoft or Google. They're very much tied, except in some very unique circumstances, to Apple's hardware. So over time, unless they change that, this whole thing is still going to be driven by the iPhone long term. All right. Now, Dan, if Apple does cross this $1 trillion mark again, do you think that will give the company any extra momentum? Look, I fundamentally think the comeback story that Cook has engineered here is some of the finishing touches on his legacy and maybe his best defining chapter. And I think if we get north of a trillion, we expect to see new highs in this name over the coming weeks and months. But I think it gives them mojo. 
It shows investors are buying into the thesis with services. And look, we believe the services business on a standalone basis is worth 400 to 450 billion. This stock's getting re-rated, and ultimately we believe it sets the stage for Apple to make a significant acquisition in content, which will be the final piece of the puzzle on that streaming content service, which will officially go live in the fall. Okay, but there are still so many outstanding questions about this service, how much it's going to cost, how many people are actually going to be able to access this, you know, Apple shows being then blocked from other platforms um, because they're competitors to Apple. Um, Max, what Dan th said there is, is quite profound, but how difficult is it going to be for Tim Cook to live up to that given that the iPhone is, it's still, is still its biggest moneymaker and smartphone sales globally are slowing down? Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, competition on these, uh, you know, entertainment services is pretty steep. I mean, you know, Netflix obviously has a very compelling offering. Amazon has a huge catalog. HBO, substantial catalog, plus these, you know, mega hits like Game of Thrones. And, and so, you know, it's, you know, Apple did bring out the star power, you know, at that event in March. But again, like, this is, it's going to be more than just a couple of hit shows that they're going to need, um, you know, a big uh, content, uh, you know, big batch of content that they can offer people to justify the price. So so that's going to be a challenge. And then the other thing is, because it's tied in with iPhone sales, you're, you're, you're sort of limiting the, the possible market. So then you're, you're either asking people to, who are not already Apple you know, families to both you know, pay for this subscription and to buy a, a, some new hard, hardware, which could be great but it, for Apple, but it could also be too big an ask for, for consumers. In the meantime, Mark, we're going to dig into Qualcomm earnings in the next block with Ian King, but we did get this information. A specific number, Apple paying Qualcomm $4.7 billion to settle this global patent showdown. We didn't know what the number was. What do you make of that number? Yeah, in some respects, Apple actually got a good deal here, which is, you know, a little surprising. Up to $4.7 billion, you know, compares to the $7 billion that Qualcomm claimed that, you know, Apple owed them via the contract manufacturer. Now, there was one estimate that that you know, added up to like $8 an iPhone, but could go up to the mid-teens for every iPhone sold. Is that included in the $4.7 billion number? You know, I'll, I'll let Ian tell you more about it, but <laughs> I know that we, we spoke to the CEO of Qualcomm and, and they're not commenting on individual licensing agreements for the devices themselves, just this one lump sum payment uh, that they owed them in terms of the back pay. All right, we're going to dig into that a little bit more in the next block. Mark Gurman of Bloomberg Tech, Max Chafkin, Bloomberg Business Week, Dan Ives, of Wedbush on the phone there. Thank you all. Switching gears now, British Defense Secretary Gavin Williamson has been fired after investigation into leaks from a secret government meeting about Chinese telecom firm Huawei. Theresa May's office says the UK Prime Minister has lost confidence in Williamson. An investigation was launched last week after reports the Security Council, which meets in private, had agreed to let Huawei participate in some aspects of Britain's new 5G wireless communications network. Prime Minister May has named Penny Mordaunt as the new UK Defence Secretary. Coming up, Qualcomm second quarter numbers are in, as well as what it expects Apple to pay after their legal battle finally came to a close. We'll break it all down next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Now back to earnings, and they are Qualcomm. Shares of the chipmaker falling after hours despite a beat on revenue in the second quarter with $4.8 billion. Investors didn't seem impressed, even with Qualcomm saying it expects to see a windfall from its two-year legal battle with Apple of around $4.5 billion. The problem? A forecast that reflects continued weakness in demand in China. For more, I want to get to New York and our Bloomberg Markets reporter, Abigail Doolittle. Our Ian King is still on the phone uh, dealing with these Qualcomm results. So, Abigail, explain this to us because Apple is out there saying iPhone demand in China 
has improved or at least has stabilized. And then these numbers from Qualcomm tell a different story in yeah, China. It's pretty interesting, Emily. So in terms of the quarter that they just reported, they did beat, as you mentioned, both top and bottom line estimates, but driving the stock down, because initially in the pre-market, the stock reacted to the upside, is the fact that the third quarter earnings guidance of adjusted earnings of 70 cents to 80 cents, that range below a dollar uh, earnings per share. And interesting to what you were just talking about, the divergence between Apple saying that their strength and Qualcomm uh, having this weakness, it goes even deeper because if you look at that third quarter guidance and if you were to break down um, the royalties that you were talking about from Apple, those are really pretty impressive, but it tells you that the handset business, the core business, uh, is weaker, really kind of matching uh, some of the expectations that they've been talking about in terms of declining uh, mo movement there. And this, to some degree, Emily, has to do with they're all about the high-end handsets. So the high-end handsets for Qualcomm uh, really not doing very well and unlikely to be made up by some of their other businesses, such as auto. About 20% of their business comes from non-handset business. Uh, and the high-end handset, that's a higher margin business um, and unlikely to also be made up by some of the lower-end handsets. But that divergence probably has a lot to do um, with the high-end handsets that Qualcomm really features to or plays to more. So let's talk about this number that we now know Apple is paying Qualcomm to settle this global legal dispute, four and a half to four point seven billion dollars. How are investors responding to that? Well, you know, so I spoke with Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Anand Srinivasan a couple times this afternoon, and his work um, that I was just talking about suggests that that payment is better than what he had forecasted, which is why the handset business, the core business, actually looks worse, which is why the stock could be selling off a little bit. So from that perspective, uh, it looks pretty strong, at least relative to Anand Srinivasan's uh, expectations. But, you know, Emily, I think that's something that investors are really going to want. You know, they say that the uh, devil is in the details, and Qualcomm is saying that the terms are, uh, I think what was the exact language here, uh, in line with general practices, investors and analysts are probably going to want a little more detail than that. But as far as that payment for the third quarter of $4.5 billion to $4.7 billion, um, it seems, according to at least Anand Srinivasan uh, and some of the reaction from the stock, because it was actually down more in the, the after hours here, um, it's down, but off of the lows, uh, you know, that that's acceptable. Right. So let's talk a little bit more about the details and what we know you know there are some analysts out there saying that this breaks down to eight dollars an iphone that could go up to the mid-teens is that number fixed that four and a half to four point seven billion dollars or could it grow over time you know emily that's a little bit beyond my area of expertise relative to qualcomm uh, and apple but i think that as time goes on we'll have more information about that um, and again, relative to um, what Bloomberg Intelligence is saying, that number is better than they had expected. Um, so perhaps it can grow over time. But again, that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise. All right. So, Abigail, obviously you follow all the chip stocks. Uh, talk to us about what you're looking ahead to when it comes to the broader semiconductor industry. Well, you know, you've had such a run-up this year, and actually I should mention that run-up for Qualcomm, too. For some, to some degree, um, this was a bit of a relief quarter, even though we do have a little bit of the sell-off. But when you put into the perspective of the 50% rise on the year for Qualcomm, um, you know, falling 2% in the after hours is not a huge move. But that's true, too, for the SOX, that semiconductor index on the year up about 30%, a really hot sector after the brutal quarter, uh, fourth quarter. But the question is whether or not that can stay in place. Because if you look at the trends, DRAM pricing, and pricing, the spot pricing for both of those areas of memory, uh, they are declining. So you have chip stocks moving higher while there's lots of fundamentals that are moving in the wrong direction. It will be very interesting to see how that divergence plays out. But to your point about Apple talking about strength uh, in China and for their iPhone, uh, there was quite a tailwind today for some of those Apple suppliers. So it looks like there's going to really be uh, some interesting action ahead to watch to see whether or not the pricing for memory uh, and some of the other fundamentals fundamentals, which again is going in the wrong direction, is correct, or some of these stock prices that are high sky is, but uh, the sky, high as the sky. Um, but at the end of the day, you can bet that they're probably going to come back together, which historically has happened. All right. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle keeping a watch on the markets for us. Thanks so much, Abigail. Well, Brexit Day came and went on March 29th, and the UK remains in the EU for now. But the lingering uncertainty of what comes next is a prime concern for the co-president of India's second largest IT provider, Infosys, 
At the Milken Conference, Mohit Joshi compared Brexit's impact on his customers to another infamous global event, Y2K. Take a listen to this exclusive conversation. It is something which is of huge concern to all of our clients and therefore is a matter of concern to us as well. Uh, we work very closely with the Confederation for British Industry. We work very closely with our clients. And what they're telling us is that the uncertainty is really impacting them. The uncertainty is impacting their investment plans. And uh, the big concern for our clients is that they don't know what shape Brexit will take and therefore what impact it will have on their business, what impact it will have on their people, and what impact it will have on their end clients. So it's the uncertainty and the uncertainty about the uncertainty, right? Uh, nobody knows if there is a fixed date when it will end. There has been a comparison drawn previously to Y2K. But I think all of us knew when Y2K would, uh, would come to a head, right? In this case, nobody knows whether it's going to be June or July or October or, you know, 2020. For Infosys itself, what are the options in terms of preparation? What are you doing? How are you anticipating it? Sure. So I think for us, the impact largely comes because of the impacts that we see on our clients. And the impact comes on our ability to see if talent can be mobile, you know, beyond the UK, for instance. And that's something that we plan for very thoroughly. We're working very closely with our clients on their plans. Let's say we relocate parts of the business to Dublin or to Amsterdam. We're also working very closely with uh, the immigration authorities to get an early sense of what they're thinking. We're working with our employees, especially European employees, to make sure that we're able to address any concerns that they may have. But what are the options for you available out there in terms of securing talent, which is sure. at most important? Sure. So if you look at localization of talent, that has been a huge initiative for us. If you look at uh, you know, the U.S., for instance, we've hired over 10,000 people in the past 15 months. We have a similar initiative going on in other parts of the world, including in the UK, in, the, in Europe, and in Australia. Also, some of the acquisitions that we've done over the past couple of months have also helped us build a base of talent. For instance, we acquired a design studio called Brilliant Basics in London. We acquired a company called Fluido uh, in the Nordics that gives us Salesforce talent. And we've just done a JV with ABN Amro. Is that adding to your cost? Well, it's also adding to, uh, you know, to our capabilities in the region, right? So obviously there is a cost that goes with the acquisition. But the reason we've done these acquisitions is because we feel that they have the ability to scale and the ability to add unique skill sets Then we can take to our clients. Infosys co-president there, Mohit Joshi, with our own Haslinda Amin. Coming up, the original content competition continues to heat up, but with players like Netflix and Disney, does Facebook have a fighting chance for key viewers? We'll discuss next. I'm Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Tesla has been sued over a fatal crash in California. The autopilot system of a 2017 Model X allegedly malfunctioned and steered the car into a concrete barrier. The family of the driver who died in that crash said in a complaint that the electric car lacked safety features, such as a properly functioning automatic emergency braking system, despite being touted as state of the art. Tesla declined to comment on the suit. While the competition in original content continues, in recent weeks, Apple joined the game, announcing its new original streaming service. Disney's unveiled a new platform for its movies and shows, and Netflix admitted to selling bonds in order to bring in more cash for its original content. But those aren't the only players in the game. Founded in 2017, Religion of Sports was created to bring viewers behind the scenes of the lives of professional athletes. Thursday, a new series called Steph vs. the Game, featuring Golden State Warriors star Steph Curry, will premiere on Facebook Watch. Joining us now, Religion of Sports co-founder Gotham Chopra. Gotham, thank you so much for being here. So, why Facebook Watch? Well, you know, Facebook Watch is pretty, um 
pretty unique in that like the athletes that we're working with or we've worked with over the last two years at least have an existing community I mean they have fans who have already signed up or liked um, you know a page so Steph Curry I think has you know something like 8 million people on his Facebook page another 25 million people who follow him on Instagram so it's sort of like a community that's already engaged and, and asking for more content um, and this is one way of providing it so it's an interesting choice given all of the other available platforms out there and given the many reputational issues that Facebook is going through at sure. this moment. Do those concern you? Not really. I mean, I'd like to think of us as one of the you know, places within the Facebook ecosystem, especially with the athletes and the stories that we're telling with that are inspiring, that are, you know, sort of aggregating that community, that are engaging that community and stuff that is um, inspirational, motivational. I mean, Steph in particular, you know, he has a message, like he has a mission that he's trying to sort of um, spread. And so I think, you know, in that respect, it's, it's sort of like the perfect platform because, again, there's already that audience that is bought in. So tell us a little bit more about Steph versus the game. What are we going to see? Well, so I've been with Steph probably, I was thinking about it this morning, over the past year. We started at the Western Conference Finals last year. We're about, we're almost there. A few more games to go. And, you know, over that time, we've sort of the A story chronicles, can the Warriors, can Steph and the Warriors win a third consecutive championship or fourth in five years, which would pretty much establish them as the definitive, um, you know, franchise or dynasty of their era. But then it's also getting underneath that. And he's a 31-year-old athlete at the top of his game, but but, you know, aside from those 82 games across the season, what is it? What's the anatomy of that greatness? So really getting underneath that and, you know, who is he? What is he motivated by? What is the backstory on this guy that we're seeing sort of, like I said, at the peak of his powers right now? We were just seeing video of a baby Steph shooting baskets. So you have my attention. Um, you know, as a content creator, I'm curious in some ways, I bet it's never been better to be a content creator because there are so many different outlets. But I wonder, are you ever concerned that there's too much content now, concerned that your stuff could get lost in the shuffle? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's something that, you know, not only are there so many platforms and there's so much content, but even like with Steph Curry in particular, he's very much on social media. His wife is very much on social media. So finding that way of like, you know, a story that feels fresh or some sort of perspective, that in of itself is a challenge. But I think it's also, you know, an opportunity. And, and it's, it's such an amazing time. We're not bound by format. We're not bound by a certain structure. You know, it used to be, okay, you did half hours or hours. Now now you kind of figure it out as you go and the, the story is king. So I think stepping back, you sort of, yes, it's, it's, it's never been a better time. And there's so many platforms that, you know, like when you have something like this, there's a lot of places, you know, to go out into the marketplace with. All right. Well, we'll be watching this roll out. And of course, your work uh, also uh, contributed to by Tom Brady, Michael Strahan, um, Gotham Topra, Religion of Sports uh, CCO. Thank you so much for joining us. Coming up, Udacity co-founder Sebastian Thrun joins to discuss the new scholarship they're rolling out with Facebook to expand education for deep learning and AI, specifically tied to privacy. Later, we'll focus on a digital startup that's helping women employees better navigate family planning. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. For years, Udacity has been helping students learn the skills needed in the next wave of tech disciplines like AI, deep learning, VR. And as demand for privacy and security focused tools grows, there's an opportunity there for new talent. Udacity is partnering with Facebook now on a new scholarship for education on privacy and encryption skills. Co-founder Sebastian Thrun with us now here in the studio. Good it's to have you back on the show. It's been a while. Great seeing you always, Emily. So talk about this new scholarship, Secure and Private AI. How will this work? There's a new program we have for people and companies that care about privacy and security in the AI space. It's actually quite interesting. When you do machine learning, you get all this data in, and there's always a chance that your data gets compromised somehow. And there's now new methods that can train a machine to learn without even understanding the raw data. It sounds magical, but it adds massive amounts of security to any machine learning approach. So it's interesting that you're announcing this in partnership with Facebook. Facebook is backing 
5,000 Yes, yeah, 5,000 square here. seats. And Facebook is notoriously not focused on privacy, but this <laughs> is part of their new mission. Yeah, exactly. Why I mean, Facebook? I mean, we work with Facebook, with Google, with Amazon, mm -hmm. with pretty much anybody in this field. And privacy is a universal concern. It doesn't mean we always get it right here in Silicon Valley, but everybody, everybody cares. And how would you describe the pool of talent who can, you know, focus on, who, who have the expertise on privacy and security related issues? Mm. I mean, is, is there just not enough people to satisfy There demand? is almost nobody right now. It's a very new topic. You might think it's really old, but with the level of cyber attacks going up every, mm. every week, every month by state actors and so on, the sophistication of the defenses have to go up as well. And very few companies are good at this. Mm. What we do at Hidassi, we train people. We train people with the latest skills. This is a, a Oxford PhD student built it with us and DeepMind, Google's company, funded by, eventually by Facebook scholarships. But we really build the latest and best so that any person on the planet can now become a privacy expert. So when you say there's almost nobody right now, like should we be worried about our privacy and how well we're being yeah. protected at this moment by and the current generation of technologists? And we're learning about it every single day. We're learning about programs that Google and others do and together with governments and so on. I think this is something as, as technology progresses, there's always uh, a good user and a bad user, and we have to defend ourselves against bad users and learn how to really focus on the good users. So you announced this at Facebook's Mobile Developers yeah. Conference, F8, um, and it obviously works well with Mark Zuckerberg's new strategy going forward to be more privacy focused. He made a joke yesterday that fell a little flat. Let's take a listen to that. Now look, I, I get that a lot of people aren't sure that we're serious about this. <laughs> I know that we don't exactly have the, the strongest reputation on privacy right now, to put it lightly. So there was a slightly awkward pause there <laughs> because, well, that's an understatement. Um, do you think this strategy can really get Facebook back on track or improve its reputation? I do believe in Silicon Valley at large and not single any company, mm -hmm. we need to take these issues super seriously. And it starts with training. It starts with technology training, with people getting the right mm -hmm. skills to bring this to the workforce. I would say, being a technologist myself, it's been amazing what happened in the last 10 years. We have the genie out of the bottle. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. we do something and we reach a billion people. Mm -hmm. What is lacking is the, the responsible, ethical, and technical training mm -hmm. that makes this all secure. Is it just the technical expertise that's missing, or is it also the values? Because it almost seems like values haven't caught up with what people now want? Uh, I think that we have to have a very broad discussion across the entire nation what we want and what we stand for as Americans and as me as a, as a wannabe and, and now actual American as a, as a pesky immigrant as, I, <laughs> as you say. And we have to really have a dialogue that goes all the way to Washington and everybody to see what is right for us. Um, and that dialogue is now beginning. Uh, I see Udacity actually playing a big role in this because we teach people. We have now 75,000 graduates. We have over 10 million students. We teach people all across the nation and we can bring those values to anybody in the tech field. So give us an update on, on the latest at Udacity. How many nano degrees have you um, awarded? Yeah. And you know, what are, tell us about all of the disciplines. I know there's been some restructuring and reorganization and you're in a new phase. We, we love it. We've awarded something like 86,000 or so nano degrees, 75,000 graduates. Most of them find jobs in places like Google and Facebook, but also at t many, many companies. And what I'm most excited about is, I think we're now beginning to really invent a, a new degree. Mm -hmm. um, the nano degree is becoming what we call the fourth degree. It's like an, an industry accepted credential from top companies as a way to recruit and certify people who want to be lifelong learners, who don't want to be done with learning after college, but want to continue brushing up their tech skills. And that to me is great because it means we can really transform the entire American workforce into one where people continue to learn, get these new skills, get new job opportunities, make more money and, and have a better life. Now, you wear a lot of hats. You're also the CEO of Kitty Hawk. You're uh, self-flying car company, <laughs> or just flying car company. Give us the latest on where Kitty Hawk is today. I mean, yeah, Where's I that flying love, car? I when think, can I ride? I think you were the first person ever driving the Google, first journalist ever driving the Google self-driving car many years ago. Yes, I remember this. Yes, you. And it looked like a crazy idea. <laughs> the same way the flying car looks crazy. Um, we've done in the order of 22,000 test flights. We built over 100 of those, and we're still in the development phase. It's 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 not safe enough yet to really 
unleash to the people, but we have this vision. We believe we can get you from downtown San Francisco to Berkeley in three minutes, or so from San Francisco to Palo Alto in 15. So how does your vision incorporate what's already out there? You know, of course, we've got ride sharing, you've got Uber working on flying taxis. There are many different theories about what the roads and the skies are going to look like. What's yours? So my, my I've, I've worked on self-driving cars for a long time. I started the Waymo team, obviously. Yes, so okay. I have a long you're, history. You're the, you, you're the inventor and of the self-driving uh, car. But <laughs> Literally, we always have to get all of your <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry. into every interview. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. Is, but for a long time, I, I really believed that the self-driving car would be the, the panacea, the, the thing that solves all traffic problems, because we, we kill uh, 1.2 million people um, every year in, in traffic accidents mm -hmm. in the world. And then I realized, um, together with my, my, my partner Larry Page, if you just go like three, four hundred feet up, there's almost nothing to hit. Mm -hmm. There's no kids running around, no bicycles, mm -hmm. no curbs, no, no whatever you, you care about doesn't exist. And while there's a new problem now how to manage traffic up there, mm -hmm. you can now build systems that are so quiet you won't even notice them. Mm -hmm. So for me, if, I, if I'm a futurist, a visionary, I believe it's inevitable at some point that we will daily, in a daily commute, go up in the air, and when that happens, it'll be the end of traffic. When? When does that happen? <laughs> That's the $10,000 question. Not today, and I hope we're going to have something on the market in the next like three, four years. So you mentioned Larry Page. Obviously, you went on to found Google X. Google still working on self-driving cars. So is Uber. So is, is, is Tesla. Who owns this market? Will it, will it always be uh, many different players? Do you think one or two will pull ahead? That's a great question, and, and, and the market is still very open. I mean, people always believe Waymo has kind of won, but, but we have to remind ourselves, none of the companies have rolled up a big business. In fact, the most successful today is Tesla. Tesla actually has rolled out a real autopilot, which has self-driving car features. Um, I believe on the ground, um, there will be one or two companies that will own the market. And the reason is uh, the same logic by which uh, ride-sharing is owned by two companies in the States, not by 50, you get this network effect. Uh, the more cars you operate, the shorter it is for you to get one, and the better the user experience. So, so there's a natural, um, just like Facebook has a network effect among your friends, an initial network effect among self-driving cars. So which two companies? <laughs> if I were to invest today, I would definitely invest in Waymo. And the second one I would think for a long time. Okay, not Tesla, necessarily. Uh, I think, look, boy, I'm not an analyst. <laughs> um, I am impressed by what Tesla has been doing, and I use a Tesla every day, and I love the autopilot feature, but I think it's a long shot from an autopilot all the way to city driving without a driver in sight. And that's mm -hmm. where I believe Waymo right now has a leading edge. Okay, so I ha last question I have to ask you because Google and Wing just got yeah. FAA approval for drones to deliver consumer goods. Yeah. They're an airline now. Right, right. Who would have thought that a search engine company becomes an airline? Who, who would have thought? I mean, is this the beginning of something big? Will, will the flyer or, or have some sort of role in delivery? So first, anybody caring about this, we have a course on this in Udacity. But okay. leaving this aside, you know. uh, <laughs> um, I think the insight that, 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 that Jeff and, and, and Larry and, and, and Google and, and Amazon had is, is actually very correct, which is at some point, it will be better to, to transport things through the air. And the reason it's faster, it is, it'll be safer and it'll be less energy or more energy efficient than the ground. Um, the difference between that, what Google Wing is doing and, 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 and Jeff Bezos, Amazon, and us at Kitty Hawk is we, our package is a person. Mm -hmm. So I, I care more about me getting about the environment fast than I care about my Amazon package. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about people is we have all the same form factor. Like we all have roughly the same size, roughly the same mm -hmm. weight. So we fit into the same box. It makes it much easier to design an aircraft for me than for Amazon packages. Interesting, that's a very interesting point. All right, Sebastian, always good to have you here. <laughs> Co-founder of Udacity, CEO of Kitty Hawk, father of the self-driving car. Thank you. Thank you so much, by. Emily. Okay, coming up, tech is transforming every aspect of healthcare as we know it. That includes women's health, how one startup, Maven, is embracing telemedicine to keep women in the workforce. That is next, this is Bloomberg. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, women control 80% of healthcare decisions. But despite that, few healthcare options are tailored specifically for women. 
Healthcare startup Maven wants to close that gap. Using telemedicine, Maven is focused on giving women and families better access to healthcare and information with a larger goal of keeping parents in the workforce. Maven's digital app provides a virtual clinic where users can connect with professionals and access services from egg freezing to postpartum counseling. Joining us to discuss Maven founder and CEO, Kate Ryder. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So first tell us how important women are in making health care decisions for themselves and their families. Um, well, so women are often the chief medical officers of their homes, and if you think about one of the first big healthcare experiences that you have if you've been relatively healthy is, is having a baby. Um, and so that disproportionately falls, um, you know, on, on the woman's shoulders and then, uh, you know, growing the baby into pediatrics and all of the other decisions for the family oftentimes is controlled by the woman. So I think one of the things that we saw when I started Maven five years ago is if you just designed a business and a system that really focuses on women as the primary consumer of healthcare, you could design a better system. So how does Maven work? So um, we have a lot of different digital programs from IVF to egg freezing to pregnancy to early pediatrics and um, adoption. And you enter our digital programs, you have access to our telemedicine network, which has over 20 different types of clinical behavioral and wellness specialists. And you can talk to them at any time of the day, of the night, whenever you need it. Um, it could be anyone from a lactation consultant to an OBGYN, a women's health physical therapist, an adoption coach. Um, and then you, uh, you, know, you get uh, a care concierge that also helps you navigate this kind of huge experience. Is this covered by insurance? So we sell primarily to employers and then health plans. So uh, so yes, your, your employer would cover it or your health plan would cover it. So what's to stop other health care providers from offering more services to women? To, you mean like hospital right, systems? Right, right. And, and, you know, I think that one of the biggest problems has been that the, the lack of specialists that are covered in the system. So for instance, lactation consulting, women's health physical therapy, these are, are you know, breastfeeding and, and recovering from childbirth are huge issues, but oftentimes they're not really in network. And so by providing, you know, maternal mental health is another big area. Um, a lot of times uh, an insurance network won't have maternal mental health specialists that can help women through postpartum depression. So when we built our network, we built it with an eye towards specialty in this part of health So there are other telemedicine companies out there, doctors on demand, uh, mail order mm -hmm. services. You know, what separates you from them? Well, so we run the largest women's health network, so they don't have any of these types of specialists that we do. Um, and then, you know, the programs that we've built, maternity, uh, fertility, they don't offer any of those programs. So it's, it's pretty unique to us. So what do you say to the folks who, who, who argue that virtual care can create a disconnect between patient and specialist or that patients are not cared for as well if all of their care comes virtually? So we're very much a complement to what's going on during IVF for pregnancy. So our OBGYNs, for, for instance, are so grateful that we're uh, in the picture because when their patients are coming to them and they're complaining of issues that have to do with, you know, mental health, nutrition, you know, things that are out of their control, um, they can actually refer them to Maven. And I think the other kind of bigger point is that OBGYNs and just doctors in general are extraordinarily busy. Um, and so, but patients have a ton of questions. And so if they're able to kind of have a support network to get a lot of those questions answered before coming into the, the you know, an in-person visit, then it can be just a much more effective and efficient in-person visit. Now, is one of your goals then to keep more women in the workforce? And if, if so, how? So one of the big statistics um, that was, is a bit disturbing is that 43% of new moms drop out of the workforce in the first 52 weeks after having a baby, and 75% of them are saying that they actually wanted to stay in. And so, you know, a lot of, when we really dug into those issues, it was, you know, sometimes it was issues that we couldn't control, like childcare or, or financial issues, but other times it was just not having the, uh, the right manager, not returning to work in a supportive environment, physical issues that just kind of carried over into, you know, a short paid leave. and so. Um, so what we do is we really help people in this kind of postpartum and return to work period get back on their feet, get healthy, talk to career coaches, talk to back to work coaches. So then, and then by the time they enter the workforce, um, you know they're that much healthier and confident, and, and they're ready to go. And then we also have part of our return to work program has manager training, so we're able to then feed back at an org level. Um, you know what are some of the, the issues that some of the employees are facing when they return to work and how to make it better. So what's your outlook more broadly on how technology will continue to change the health? care market. I mean, healthcare has been one of the industries that's been very slow to change, very slow to adapt to technology. So, you know, is it completely different in, let's say, five years, ten years? 
Great question. So <laughs> I can't even email my doctor. I know, <laughs> I know. I've just come off like two months of healthcare conferences where everyone talks about this. Um, and so I think that really the every, the jury says that, you know, healthcare does take a while, but within, you know, 10 years, you're going to start to really see meaningful impact on just not only like, you know, virtual care, that's what's one of the most exciting trends, obviously, but but really leveraging AI to, to solve some of these more complex medical cases and to make everything more efficient. But I mean, there are so many problems problems, don't get me wrong, so like we, we have to solve some really basic problems in front of us, which is kind of what Maven's doing um, uh, before we can you know, get into this, this other, you know, the, these well, other I'm looking forward issues. to those. <laughs> okay, Kate Ryder, CEO of Maven, thank you so much. Thank you. For stopping by. Still ahead, camera maker GoPro has attempted to go from media company to drone maker, but now it's going back to its roots. GoPro founder and CEO Nick Woodman talks about the company's biggest obstacles and opportunities ahead. This is Bloomberg. Shares of digital payments processor Square falling after hours Wednesday after the company lowered its revenue guidance for the second quarter. That the company beat on both first quarter earnings and revenue at forecast revenue of 545 to $555 million below analyst estimates. This as its cash register and payments processing businesses faces increasing competition from companies like PayPal. Meantime, Square said the cash app saw volume increase by 150% in the first quarter. Well, camera maker GoPro announced this week that its YouTube channel has surpassed 2 billion views, a big milestone for a company that has seen so many ups and downs. I sat down with GoPro founder and CEO Nick Woodman in the latest episode of Bloomberg Studio 1.0 to talk about competition in the sports camera market and the challenges that lie ahead. Take a listen. We were trying uh, a lot of new things. Just because you're successful in one area doesn't mean it necessarily translates to success in, in another. I use an analogy that uh, just because you're an all-star pitcher doesn't necessarily mean you can go and play quarterback. In an effort to grow GoPro beyond our initial success, we tried many different things that made a lot of sense. At one point you were like, we're going to be a media company. That's right. And I still think we have a lot of opportunity in many of these areas and, and more. but. Uh, we didn't um, have the right approach, we didn't have the right skill set, mm -hmm. and I think we maybe uh, took on too much too soon, and we would have been better served, I believe, to stay, you know, hindsight's 2020, but to stay very focused on what um, our our core purpose, I believe, our core purpose in the world is, which is to help people capture and share experiences that would otherwise be difficult mm -hmm. to do. And uh, now we're back to that. And wouldn't you know, the business is growing again. We're on track for profitability again. You also got into drones. And that, at the time, also made sense. But then the drones started falling out of the sky, and it was all <laughs> caught on GoPro. <laughs> what went wrong there? It was a very big deal because of a very simple problem. Uh, there was a, a hinge that holds the battery into its compartment. The hinge was made out of plastic and it would deflect over time and lose its retention and the battery would back out from vibration. Then you only have to have a battery back out just a little bit to lose power. Uh, once we replaced that hinge with a metal hinge, uh, problem solved. But you know, our challenge in the drone space wasn't because of that initial product uh, failure, it was because um, there's just that the consumer drone market, we're a consumer company, consumer product company, consumer drone market just isn't as big as everybody thought it was going to be. We looked at it and we said, not enough of our customers want these, there's not enough profit to be made, it's too expensive to be in, let's get out of the business. Now you're not doing this in a vacuum, I mean there is competition, there's Sony, there's various Chinese companies that are doing what you do or trying to do what you do. How do you continue to differentiate your core product when there's you know, folks out there that are trying to make it cheaper and better? Reinvent it and push the limits every year. I've been very uh, vocal about our need to come out with exciting new products every year. 
that was one of the lessons learned uh, was that in years where we didn't come out with something new and exciting for our customers, sales dropped. One of the reasons that um, we've maintained our leadership position in every market that we sell in around the world uh, is because we are relentless in developing new uh, innovation and, and new products. And I think we're running at a pace that is difficult for anybody else to keep up with. You mentioned some of our competitors. They haven't come out with new products in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we're just wearing everybody out. There was the threat of tariffs uh, between the United States and China, and you decided to move some of your production out of China. That's right. Tell me about that. We are moving our US bound uh, camera production to Mexico, but uh, we are keeping rest of world production of cameras in China. So cameras that are going to Europe or cameras that are destined for Asia will still be produced in China, uh, but the US bound production in Mexico helps us avoid any threat of tariff. So you saw the trade tensions happening and said, we're not gonna get caught in this. We have a, a saying at GoPro, um, we don't want to be a deer in headlights. We want to be the ones driving the truck, and then we're going to turn. We're going to not hit the deer either. Don't worry about the deer. But we definitely don't want to be the deer. And what that means is that um, we want to have more say in our destiny. And so we said, let's let's go research where else we would build our products for the U.S. market. Uh, we end, we landed on Mexico, and as uh, through our research, we we learned that there were also financial benefits, logistical benefits to doing so. Uh, anyway, uh, regardless of tariffs or no tariffs, so whether or not uh, the uh, uh, tariff threat uh, to our product category becomes real, we're, we're happy to be moving our uh, U.S. bound production to Mexico. My interview with GoPro CEO Nick Woodman there. You can catch that full interview tonight on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Thursday, we're going to be speaking with Scott Guthrie, Microsoft Executive Vice President, who's been at the helm of Azure since 2011, helping Microsoft to climb to the top of the cloud industry. We're live streaming on Twitter. As always, we'll be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.